Thank you, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. My name is Mike Biersick. I'm the CEO and founder of QControl. And I wanted to tell you today about something that's extremely exciting, I think not just for us, but as a mark of progress in our ecosystem. This is the Q2B conference, and a huge aspect of what we focus on is ensuring we're delivering real value to the end users of all the technology you've heard about in the last talks and everything you'll hear about here. And that is based on the world's first natively embedded performance management software for quantum computing, the partnership that we have that we recently announced between QControl and IBM Quantum. Now, if you're not that familiar with QControl, we're focused on building AI-powered infrastructure software in order to make quantum computing useful. Now, I want to be clear when I say AI-powered, I don't mean chat GPT wrappers. I really mean building novel algorithmic approaches to control hardware in such a way as to make it do useful things. We provide the software that connects the lowest levels of the stack, the quantum processing devices, QPUs, as well as the incredible control electronics from our friends at Quantum Machines, up to the high levels of abstraction, programming frameworks, algorithms, applications, quantum as a service. We provide everything in the middle that makes the hardware work right. We provide the instructions in order to make the hardware do useful things. We're very proud that at this time we have actually just about 13,000 users across all of our various software products. One thing that I think is extremely important to talk about is the fact that the only way to push forward is to actually work with hardware. In the earliest stages of the development of our sector, there has been a huge emphasis on running simulations, running pretend quantum computing on classical computers. And that only goes so far. And of course, we all know it only goes so far, and that's why we think about building quantum computers. But it only even goes so far in the development of the application side. From a survey we ran uh, about a year and a half ago, we learned from people who build algorithms that they themselves said they needed access to devices with 50 or more qubits. Roughly half of them said that number, 50 or more qubits, in order to achieve their research objectives over the next two to three years. It makes plain that simulators have a limited shelf life, that running on hardware is the only way to go. But as I would imagine almost everybody in this room knows all too well, hardware is not perfect. Quantum hardware is extremely susceptible to error. When we encode information into a quantum system, it tends to degrade very rapidly. And that degradation leads to errors. Many of you will have seen me show this kind of graph before. The difference between what you expect in an algorithm, here a version of Grover's search based on technology from Be It Tech, a needle in a haystack type search that should identify a particular location in the output of the co computer, but when you actually run it on real hardware, the bottom panel is data, you get effectively nonsense output. Errors mask the value that users are trying to achieve. There has been a huge amount of effort across the entire community to address this. You've heard about it in the talks in the session. I'm sure you hear about it in the news. These are things like quantum error correction. Quantum error correction involves an algorithmic approach to smear information out over many physical devices in the hope of using that redundancy to gain an advantage. The important thing here is that that smearing process requires a lot of physical overhead, many physical devices to one logical device. The other important thing is quantum error correction always makes things worse right now. I'll put an asterisk on the always because there are some very limited cases where we're getting to break even. But broadly, quantum error correction is research grade. It is not delivering real improvements in hardware. So in the intervening period, people have talked about error mitigation. IBM talks about this quite a lot. Error mitigation is post-processing. You kind of accept the fact that the hardware is noisy, and then you try to average away seeing through the noise and the results by doing a lot of post-processing, a lot of iteration. Then there is a third approach where we tend to focus more at QControl called error suppression. Just make the hardware more resilient against error using control concepts. We focus on robust control. It's like building a little force field around the individual devices to make them more resilient. Now all of these can go together. All of them can interact. And in fact, error suppression has been shown by our team to make error correction perform better. And by our customers. NordQuantique used our software 
in their demonstrations recently. But all of this has been the domain of experts, experts like me, like members of my team. And it has been out of reach for almost everybody in the community. But it simply does not need to be that way. And so we've been very excited to announce in just the last week that a complete integration of all of our error suppression performance management software is now fully configured and natively integrated into IBM Quantum Services. You can get access to it right now on their 127 qubit devices. There is no configuration, as you'll see. Everything is built for you. All you need to do is execute one command. That one command is to set the channel strategy within Qiskit and to invoke QControl as the channel strategy. Everything else is taken care of behind the scenes. You don't even need to know what any of those three categories are in order to get the benefits of our software. Now, for the experts in the room, there's quite a lot happening under the hood. We have a completely autonomous AI-driven workflow that cancels errors everywhere that they occur. It starts with an exceptionally efficient compiler that reduces circuit depth. It moves on to a learning to rank based approach to mapping your algorithm onto the best performing devices on the hardware. It eliminates crosstalk via dynamic error suppression strategies called dynamic decoupling where we embed them directly in the circuit in a very clever proprietary way. AI agents that actually completely redefine the machine language. What is the, what is the pulse that's output by say the quantum machine's hardware? What is the shape of that pulse? Our agents redesign this on the IBM hardware in about 90 seconds. That's pre-compiled at the beginning of the day and called in runtime. And then a measurement error mitigation to fix the readout errors. Every single one of these is autonomous. Every single one of them is built to be interoperable. And all of them are invoked when you run an algorithm with that one command. The results are transformational. I've shown these, this particular graph before, but I'll show some very new things in just a second. I want to remind you that when you start with that idea that errors in the hardware lead to failures in the algorithm, when you turn on this performance management, the value you want is exposed. You are able to see the answers that matter to you. And the performance improvements we have are, uh, I will admit, the numbers sometimes look a little bit ridiculous, but thousands of times greater likelihood of getting the correct answers out of these machines. I want to show you now some of the new results that are coming from IBM's utility scale devices. Here, we're looking at an algorithm called bernstein vasserani used as a test algorithm, but focusing on the idea of how a user knows that what they're getting is right. What we're showing is how many repetitions you need on the vertical, that's how many shots, as a function of how likely you are to get the correct answer. So 90% confidence, 99%, 99.9%. And we're able to show that with just around 500 shots on a 27 qubit algorithm, you can achieve 99.9% .9 confidence that you have the right answer. By contrast, in all of these cases, without the Q-Control performance management, in 32,000 attempts, you never once get the right answer. That is the transformation, 99.9% .9 versus never. You can look at this another way, which is to say, for a given confidence level, how much effort do I need to expend? Effort here measured in how much compute time which is directly translated to cost. And in this particular demonstration, we show that you can achieve, in here, a quantum Fourier transform demonstration. You can achieve 99% confidence in 30 shots, 5,700 times fewer shots than would be required without the performance management solution turned on. That 5,700x reduction directly translates to compute time and compute cost. So you can achieve more faster. One category of problems that has become very interesting for us focuses on scheduling, routing, optimization, supply chain optimization, and the like. Why? Because our clients are coming to us saying that this is an area where they have major computational bottlenecks, and they're looking for strategic advantages. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work we've done with the Australian Army and Transport for New South Wales in this direction. But to set us up, I want to show a slide 
that actually gives me you know, the biggest risk I've taken in my career. I'm sorry there's been a formatting issue on the, uh, on the slide here. That risk is the fact that I'm going to partially, gently, and extremely politely disagree a little bit with John Preskill. I know that's generally the worst advice anybody can ever give to somebody else, but I'm gonna do it here in a very specific way. I know the argument that there hasn't been a huge amount of progress in NISC applications for quantum advantage. But we took a look at this problem from the opposite approach, not from how, how well the hardware is doing and when it's gonna solve the problem, but rather, what are the problems that have the most pull that can be solved at small scale to gain some net advantage? In these logistics problems, what surprised us a lot is that at very small size scales, these problems get very hard. Incapacitated vehicle routing, how you put passengers on buses or parcels on trucks, that problem is hard classically with 130 parcels and five vehicles. You have to move to approximations that leave results on the table. And we can claw that back, and as Nicole said, 1%, 2% can be many millions of dollars. What we analyzed was the pace of progress in the hardware community, and we saw that the potential for quantum advantage, the threshold of quantum advantage, when you're actually solving a problem at the right scale, doesn't require systems to be any bigger than they are right now. It just requires about a 20 times increase in circuit depth. That has to come from the hardware providers, and it has to come from performance management by addressing errors on the hardware. If anybody wants to see this in detail without the mess up, please ask me later. So going in that direction, we began looking at the execution of algorithms relevant to that problem. And what we were able to show is automated error suppression enabling running an algorithm called QAOA at scales that have never been achieved before. Here, I'll show you 50 qubit QAOA, but in the last three days since we launched, we've demonstrated 80 qubit QAOA, full hybrid execution. No press, classical pre-compilation, no cheating to select the best circuit and running it once. Full hybrid execution on hardware entirely in 90 seconds. In QAOA, one kind of problem that you may care about is called max cut. It's a machine learning problem that takes a graph and you ask to partition it in such a way that you maximize a value called the cut value. When you run a classical brute force, you end up with a distribution here shown in red. And unfortunately, the tail of that distribution doesn't reach to the largest cut values, the ones that are of the most interest to you. What we're able to show with these data on real hardware with our performance management solution is that we can shift that distribution by two and a half sigma, and we can boost the value of the largest cut relative to brute force or relative to not using our performance management solution by more than 32,000 times. I'll emphasize that these are non-trivial gra graphs, they are non-planar, they are classically hard, and importantly, they are not tailored to the device connectivity. These are generic max cut problems. We were even able to show that comparing against previously published work, taking the exact graphs that had been run before, we were able to consistently find the max cut at the scale of roughly 30 qubits in cases where in the published literature, competitive hardware approaches were not able to find the right approach. And again, this is done in full hybrid execution in, in, in fact, less time than it takes to run a single execution on the alternative. Overall, those numbers do, in fact, start to look a little ridiculous. I wanna emphasize everything is published in the peer-reviewed technical literature, and we keep adding to that in our online documentation. More than a 1,000x improvement in bernstein vazirani at the scale of 40 qubits. 99.9% .9 confidence in bernstein vazirani or quantum Fourier transform at the scale of only a few hundred shots. In max cut, 32,000x enhancement in your likelihood of getting the correct answer, actually finding the max cut. And recently, demonstrating the ability to generate GHZ states First at the scale of 50 qubits, more recently, some demonstrations at the scale of 60 qubits, all enabled by turning on this performance management that allows you to get all of the performance that is locked inside the platform. Again, all with one command, no need for any additional knowledge. 
This directionally is exactly what Heather West talked about as frictionless quantum software. Quantum software where vendors like Qcontrol help to ease the IT developer's learning curve so enterprises can leverage current IT skills to develop and execute quantum algorithms. We don't need people to be experts in things like error mitigation. We don't need them to be experts in compilers. We need them to run the applications that they care about and get useful results. So the focus that we've taken is on making this kind of technology actually useful at utility scale for everyone combining performance, value, and simplicity. Remember, one line of code with no configuration. So everyone can get access to the value that is being delivered from our friends at IBM and, of course, others around the community. So if you'd like to get access to this technology, go on IBM right now, or in four minutes. Go online, run algorithms on 127 qubit machines. The software is natively embedded. You select with one line of code. If you're a hardware vendor, and you'd like this kind of technology natively embedded in your system, we validated across trapped ions, neutral atoms, superconducting devices, semiconductors. Please come and talk to us. Learn more about the integration with IBM. And I'm happy in the last couple of minutes to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. OK, we do have plenty of time. And uh, so please continue to send questions. We have several already. Um, let me ask you this, and I think you hinted at this one already, Michael, is um, um, your, your software, your approaches work on, you've highlighted IBM, your results on IBM, on other hardware, and related to this, as the hardware continues to get better, does, does, uh, does your technique still provide value? Does it increase or diminish? Uh, it's a great question. So the first thing is, uh, the tools are hardware agnostic. We configure them for the individual platforms. Um, you know, what I announced, uh, this, what we announced this week and what I showed today is our industry first integration with IBM. Uh, it will certainly not be the last, so please watch this space. Uh, in terms of the progress, you know, we first did algorithmic demonstrations on IBM's seven qubit devices. Uh, was already three plus years ago. The pace of progress has accelerated on their industry roadmap. Obviously, the devices have gotten much better. And that gap between what the typical user experience is running on bigger systems and what is achievable actually widens, even as the hardware gets better. More qubits, more opportunities for error. And we've shown that on successive generations of IBM devices, we keep widening this gap, and we, by our performance management, push the user experience all the way up to the best achievable outcome from the hardware. OK. Another question. Several questions about what are your priorities going forward? Error suppression, error correction, things like that. Can you say uh, anything on that topic? So you know, as, as a company, we focus on the practical challenges that deliver utility in whatever way, you know, in the vernacular definition, uh, from quantum systems. In our view, quantum error correction is a very hard engineering problem and a math problem right now that is best left to the code developers and the hardware vendors, and we uh, want to support them. We support them in the background with our automation technology for error suppression that then makes their error correction perform better. Uh, we, we support the integration of quantum error correction in future systems, but we don't do research in QEC encoding or the like. Going forward, we're rolling out this kind of technology to larger systems, already available today on 127 qubits. We'll scale that up from there. And we're rolling it out to other platform vendors, as well as all of our tools for the R&D teams in the background as well. And one last question. Um, somebody observed that they believe the 50 qubit GHZ results that you uh, were contained in the paper referenced at the bottom of your slide, um, that those results were not in that paper, perhaps. Um, where could they find out that technical detail? Should they come by your booth, and, or do you have yes. that at the top of your head? So, yeah, of course, uh, <laughs> you know, the thing about peer-reviewed technical literature is that it's published on the timescale of journals, which is, everybody knows, like a year. So those results were stale by a huge amount by the time it was published in, in the physical review. Uh, the new results are from the last couple of weeks of benchmarking on IBM systems. They're in our technical documentation for the Q-Control integration, uh, you can come and talk to us to learn more about that. Mm -hmm.